These streams are ubiquitous. Okay, I will talk about our work on continuously tracking core atoms in data streams with probabilistic decays. Data streams are ubiquitous, such as email stream and a tweet stream. Analyzing data streams has many applications, such as trending topic detection and network security monitoring. However, the high speed and the large volume have caused many troubles. Typically, there are two ways for handling big data streams. The first one is to, re to scale up our computation power, such as building large data centers and using distributed computation. While the second approach is to reduce data complexity, such as sampling and sketching methods. The second approach is considered to be cheap and green and has attracted a lot of, of attention. Our work belongs to this second approach. The reason that we can reduce data complexity of a data stream is due to the fact that a data stream usually contains too much redundant and noisy data. For example, in Twitter, we usually don't need to read every tweet in our Twitter timeline. Instead, reading just a few of them is enough to know the majority of the topics in the stream. That said, there are some informative or representative atoms in your data stream, or what we call the core atoms in this work. This work aims to design a streaming algorithm that can continuously track core atoms in a data stream in real time, what we call the core atom tracking task. When designing the CIT algorithm, we want the algorithm to be able to gradually forget historical data in the stream. This setting is actually a trade-off between the insertion only stream setting and a sliding window stream setting, which rep represent two extremes. That's the motivation. And uh, next, we uh, formulate the CIT problem. First, we need a method to measure the informativeness of a set of atoms. We assume there is a utility function f that assigns a subset of v, a non-negative utility value. f of s could measure the informativeness, representativeness, diversity, or coverage of set s. It has been found that f of s commonly satisfies the monotone submodular property. And the heavy submodularity simply states this uh, property. Uh, for, for two sets, s and t, s is a subset of t. Then the marginal gain of an atom E with respect to this small, smaller set is no less than the marginal gain of this atom with respect to this larger set. It actually captures the diminishing return property. That's some modularity. Next, we introduce uh, this uh, probabilistic decay stream model. The PDS model generalizes the insertion on the stream model and the sliding window stream model. It's actually quite simple and easy to understand. At time t, we let an atom E arrived at time t E uh, participate in the analysis with a probability PET, which is a function of the atom's age t minus T E. Here H E is an atom specific decay function, which decreases as atom's age increases. For example, uh, the decay function could be the exponential decay function. The PDS model ensures that atoms from past to present all have a chance to participate in the analysis, but the recent it has a larger chance than past did. Now we can formulate this uh, CIT problem. We are given a monotone submodular utility function f, a PDS with atom specific decay function he, and a budget k. We want to find a subset st star at any query time t, such so that st star maximizes this expected utility, f of s given dt, 
DT denotes the atoms arrived before T. The expectation is taken upon the randomness that an atom participates in the analysis with, with the probability. And this formulation uh, prefers to choose more recent data as core atoms. Next, we introduce our algorithm to solve this CIT problem. First, we found that it's expensive to exactly calculate this expectation. To calculate the, the expectation, we have to consider the participation of the possibility of each atom in S. For example, if S consists of two atoms A and B, we need to consider whether both of them participate in the analysis, or only one of them participate in the analysis. There will be three utility function evaluations, or we see three oracle calls. In general, we need a big O two to the cardinality of S oracle calls. This is very expensive. To address this problem, we propose a Monte Carlo approximation approach. The idea is to generate n samples of the PDS and use these samples to estimate this expectation. Samples can be generated by performing Bernoulli sampling. And by Monte Carlo approximation, we, we ensure that this, this average will converge to the expectation. The advantage is that the required number of our calls is reduced to big O of n, and the average function capital F of s is still monotone and submodular. We propose the three algorithms in this work. The last two use use the first one as a basic building block to address the CIT problem. The last one further improves the efficiency of the second one. All of them ensure constant approximation ratios. We first consider the probabilistic non-decaying case, where P E T equals P E. Uh, that means each atom in the stream participates in the analysis with a constant probability. This special PDS can be converted to an insertion on the stream. For each atom in the stream, we perform n Bernoulli sampling and obtain a n-dimensional vector, we call it a sample vector. If an element of the vector is one, it means the corresponding Bernoulli sampling's outcome is one, otherwise zero. If there are many ones in the sample vector, it means the atom has a larger participation probability. Therefore, sample vector includes the participation probability of an atom. Therefore, this special PDS can be converted to an insertion only stream of sample vectors. And the submodular optimization over insertion only streams has been extensively studied. This algorithm can be adapted to solve this special CIT problem. And we will uh, denote one such adapted algorithm as PND CIT. Next, we consider the probabilistic decaying case. In this case, an atom's participation prob probability decreases over time. As a result, uh, sample vector IE is no longer a constant but involving. For example, when atom E arrives at time t equals TE, because PET is close to 1, uh, we will obtain an all one uh, sample vector. As time advances, PET decreases, and there will be more zeros in this sample vector. And finally, sample vector will become a zero vector. Now we consider the sample vectors of all atoms in the stream at time t, and denote those non-zero sample vectors by BT. Ideally, if we can fit BT, to a PND CIT instance, we will get a quality guaranteed solution at MT. The challenge is that some factors in BT is involving. How to process BT in streaming fashion? We propose PND CIT to address this problem. We assume some vector IOE becomes zero 
for L larger than capital L. That means an atom will have at most capital L non-zero sample vectors. And there are efficient methods to obtain these sample vectors when an atom arrives. Then PDCIT runs capital L PND CIT instances and process each atom's sample vectors in parallel. For example, assume capital L is three. When atom E1 arrives, we obtain a three sample vectors and feed them to three PND CIT instances. Before processing the next atom, we reset the first one and move it to the tail, and then keep on processing the next atom sum vectors. We find that the first instance always correctly processes the sum vectors in Bt. Therefore, the first instance output will be a desired solution at Mt. This is the structure of PDCIT that uses a processing and a shifting scheme. However, what if capital L is very large? Maintaining a large number of PND CIT instances will be very expensive. Uh, we propose PDCIT plus to address this problem. The idea is to selectively maintain just a few instances and hope the selected ones can well approximate the rest. This idea is similar to using a histogram to approximate a curve. So this is, is so this is a description of algorithms. We next uh, show some experiments. We perform the experiments on on several real data streams, and our goal is to maintain k most representative atoms, and we choose the exponential decaying function. We consider the three baselines, the greedy and the two sampling based methods. Uh, in the first experiment, we compare PDCIT with PDCIT plus. We want to answer two questions. How close is their solution quality? And how significant can PDCIT plus reduce the number of error calls? We found that, that PDCIT plus achieves similar solution quality with PDCIT, but reduces more than a half of the error calls. Next, we show the solution quality and compare with different methods, we found that PDCIT plus finds solutions with quality close to greedy and is much better than sampling methods. Finally is the scalability. Uh, the, the required or cause of greedy increases very fast, uh, but the PDCIT uh, increases rel relatively slow. So PDCIT plus is uh, very efficient. So this is uh, some experiments. Next, we conclude this work. Uh, the optimization problem behind the CIT is to solve the SSO problem over PDS. We designed two streaming algorithms to solve the CIT problem. And uh, we, uh, you, we conducted some experiments to, to verify the effectiveness of proposed methods. And thanks for your listening. We have time for questions. We have time for uh, questions. Uh, hello. Is somebody asking for questions? Hi, are there any questions? Okay. Um, so let me ask uh, one question on this. Uh, there is a lot of uh, prior work on uh, submodular function optimization. Right? You mentioned some of that. Um, so have you looked at any other alternatives uh, for this, uh, which could, you know, so you, you gave two options. One was to keep those K uh, recent things and shift by one and then uh, variance of uh, a small variant of it, which tries to approximate with histograms. Uh, have you considered any other alternatives uh, which might perhaps give more weightage to newer things and less for older ones and so on? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, 
there are many streaming submodular optimization methods, but uh, as far as, as we know, these methods are designed for two special streaming models, the insertion-only streaming models and the sliding window streaming models. In this work, we actually want to design streaming submodular optimization methods for probabilistic probabilistic decaying stream, stream models. And as far as we know, the, there is no methods to solve this kind of streaming optimization methods of problem. That, that, that's why we design some approximate streaming algorithm to solve this kind of uh, streaming submodular optimization problems. Okay. Uh, so the other part of my question was uh, when you take some subset of those uh, L things, right? Uh, is there uh, some specific way in which you select the subset or is it random? Oh, you, you mean the, the, the choosing of the subset of the, of the, of, of the items? N not subset of the items. Uh, you said that when the L is very large, uh, then you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know, yeah. I know. Well, when capital L is very large, the second method, the second method has to maintain a large number of basic streaming algorithm. We, we referred it uh, as right. a PND CIT, right? Right. This, this will be very in, inefficient. In the, in, the, in the third method, we, we, we try to remove, we, we try to kill some of the redundant uh, uh, algorithm instances, and uh, and we, we hope the selected ones can well approximate the rest. Right. Th that idea is similar to using a histogram to approximate the curve. Right. So the, my question was: uh, is, uh, Are these selected at random, or is there uh, some no no no? It, it's, it's, it's not selected randomly. The, 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 there are some uh, some some some. some so some methods to ensure, you, I mean, you, you can't select it randomly. You, you should select, select, select them carefully. Okay, I assume the details are in the paper. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay, if there aren't, uh, we can move on to the next talk. While the, uh, the talk, next one I think is by. Puya Memerzia, and this time Puya will be playing the video himself because of some issues with the local copy of the video. So uh, Puya, please get set, but don't start the video yet. Let me introduce you. Uh, this talk is on the art of efficient in-memory query processing on NUMA systems, a systematic approach. And the talk is by uh, presented by Puya Memerzia, who is a PhD candidate in computer science at the University of New Brunswick, Canada. His main research interests include big data systems and analytics and high performance computing and machine learning. So Puya, uh, please go ahead. Hello, and thank you for being here. My name is Puya Mamarzia. I'm a PhD student at the University of New Brunswick, located in New Brunswick, Canada. In this video, I'll be presenting my research paper from ICDE 2020. This paper is a joint effort with my co-authors, Dr. Supriya Ray and Dr. Varendra C. Bafsar. Our research explores the impact of NUMA architectures on query processing and demonstrates a systematic approach to improve query performance on these systems. Let's start off by introducing the topic and outlining our motivation and goals. Every year, the amount of new data that is generated continues to grow at an exponential rate. Analytical queries are an important tool in extracting value from this data. Exploring different ways to speed up query processing is critical because throwing more money and faster hardware at the problem is unsustainable. Furthermore, inefficiencies in software cause the hardware to be underutilized, thus increasing the financial and energy burden of all this data. On the hardware front, we are motivated by the fact that NUMA architectures are pervasive in servers and even high-end desktops. They are available in a variety of forms, including multi-socket and rack scale systems, as well as on-chip NUMA architectures. NUMA has important implications for query processing because it affects the memory bandwidth and latency. Code that doesn't take this into account suffers from suboptimal performance, 
One approach is to fine tune the code to the machine. However, this can be costly, time consuming, and we require the source code. We're motivated by some of the limitations in prior studies. Some researchers explored static solutions involving fine tuning an application to a particular system. Other researchers developed NUMA schedulers that were mostly designed for multitasking. Some researchers developed custom operating systems that haven't yet reached widespread adoption. And we also note that the role of dynamic memory allocators has been often overlooked in the literature, despite the fact that it has a very important role to play. So given the fact that NUMA has become a hot research topic in recent years, here is a brief overview of what our contributions are. To our knowledge, ours is the first study that has explored the combined impact of using different memory allocators, thread and memory placement policies, and OS level configurations all together in the context of query processing. And we provide a categorization and analysis of all these different strategies that we use to improve query performance on newer systems. Uh, we use uh, extensive experiments on different query workloads, indexes, and even database systems. And uh, we test these experiments on different machine architectures with uh, varying NUMA topologies. And we also utilize profiling and performance counters and micro benchmarks to enhance our results. Um, and we distill all of our findings into a decision flow chart, which we hope will help practitioners gain similar performance boosts in their applications on NUMA systems. I will now provide a concise background on some of the core topics that are relevant to this research. In a nutshell, a NUMA architecture describes a system where the memory is partitioned into separate nodes, but represented as a single address space. Memory access speeds vary with proximity. Accessing memory within the same node is faster due to having a direct connection to the memory controller, whereas accessing memory in a different node is typically slower due to requiring one or more hops across a shared interconnect. So query processing can be broadly divided into two categories, the disk-based approach and the main memory-based approach. In the disk-based approach, most of the data is stored on disk and a buffer is used to load parts of that data into the memory in order to perform queries on it. And this has implications for our query latency because disk IO and the buffer management can slow us down. On the other hand, with the main memory based approach, most of the data is stored in memory. This can allow us to obtain significant speed ups in orders of magnitude. However, the bottleneck shifts from disk IO to the memory hierarchy and the way that the memory is accessed. And we also see NUMA effects more severely in this kind of query processing. This slide provides an overview of the type of query workloads that we're going to be looking into. There are a total of five different workloads. We can broadly divide them into two categories. W1 through W4 are standalone queries. And uh, W5 is the industry standard TPCH workload that consists of 22 analytical queries. W1 and 2 are two different types of aggregation. W3 and 4 are joins, W3 being a hash join and W4 being an index nested loop join using four different indexes. And the main feature of these queries is that they are fairly memory intensive and they primarily feature joins and aggregation. I will now go into further detail on our approach to improving query performance on NUMA systems. We take a systematic approach consisting of four steps to improve query performance on NUMA systems. In most cases, these strategies can be applied with little to no source code modification. We do not consider specialized solutions as our goal is to accelerate queries on a variety of workloads and machines. It is worth noting that to some extent, these steps can be beneficial on other workloads and system architectures. Let's begin by examining the role that dynamic memory allocators can play on query performance on NUMA systems. So dynamic memory allocators handle the allocation and deallocation of memory during an application's runtime. 
They also handle concurrent memory allocation, false sharing, and fragmentation. And as we've mentioned before, memory allocators are an often overlooked aspect when it comes to query processing on NUMA systems. Uh, so what we did was we designed a micro benchmark involving 100 million memory operations per thread, and we tested a total of seven memory allocators. We measured two things, the time it took to complete the benchmark and the amount of memory overhead, which is basically the amount of memory that was used compared to the amount of memory that was requested. In both cases, lower numbers are better. Based on the results of this micro benchmark, we determined that Horde, TBB malloc are the fastest allocators. JE malloc provided a good balance of performance and memory overhead, and the two allocators Super malloc and MC malloc were worse in either runtime and memory overhead, so we omitted those two allocators from subsequent experiments. Implementing a thread placement strategy is an important step for any NUMA application. Without a defined placement strategy, the OS is free to migrate threads to different processors. This has been shown to result in inconsistent and degraded performance due to the high cost of cache invalidation and remote memory access. We explore two different thread placement strategies. In sparse thread placement, the threads are spaced out, prioritizing empty NUMA nodes. This approach consistently outperforms dense thread placement, which involves packing the threads and filling each node's available hardware threads before moving on to the next one. This is due to the fact that sparse maximizes memory controller bandwidth, and the bandwidth-hungry nature of our queries favors this approach. On NUMA systems, the operating system uses a memory placement policy to control the physical location of memory pages. The first touch policy, which is the default on most Linux systems, places memory pages on the first node that reads or writes to that page. The interleave policy distributes memory pages in a round robin manner. The local alloc policy places memory on the node that is performing the allocation operation and the preferred policy places memory on a selected node unless it is full, it goes to other nodes in that case. We also take a look at two other system-wide operating system settings. Uh, the AutoNuma scheduler, which defaults to being on, attempts to migrate threads and or memory pages in order to minimize remote access, and Transparent Huge Pages attempts to merge small memory pages into larger pages. I will now outline our experimental setup and parameters and present and discuss some of our results. Here are the specifications and NUMA topologies of the machines we used in our experiments. The difference between the machines is fairly substantial as each machine represents a particular CPU architecture along with the NUMA characteristics of its generation. Most notably, the machines differ in terms of CPU cache size, interconnect bandwidth, and relative latency penalties for remote memory access. Here we provide a quick glance at our experiment parameters. For greater details on how these parameters were selected and configured, please refer to section three of the paper. In our first set of results, we show that the operating system toggles AutoNuma and THP are detrimental to query performance, and this applies to different workloads, different combinations with other parameters and different machines. And we note that in subsequent results, AutoNuma and THP will be disabled from now on. Taking a closer look at the two aggregation workloads, W1 and W2, we evaluate the effect of applying different memory placement policies and overriding the memory allocator on these workloads. W1 is a holistic aggregation which features concurrent memory allocation. As a result, overriding the memory allocator provides some good performance gains, with TBB malloc being faster across the board by up to 94%. W2, on the other hand, is a distributive aggregation, which is more update heavy than allocation heavy. As a result, we don't see much of a benefit from overriding the memory allocator. However, changing the memory placement policy to interleave results in up to 44% increase in speed. W3 is a typical multi-threaded hash join workload which features many concurrent memory operations. In a similar vein to W1, we observe benefits from overriding both the memory allocator and the memory placement policy. 
On each system, we obtain optimal performance using a combination of interleaved memory replacement and the TBB malloc allocator. It is worth noting that the optimal configuration allows each machine to outperform its newer neighbor if the new machine is using the default memory allocator and memory replacement. Thus, we demonstrate that these strategies can enable older hardware to outperform newer and faster hardware. For W4, we evaluate the performance of an index nested loop join using a variety of different index data structures. For each index, we vary the memory allocator and the memory placement policy. We then take the best configuration for each index and set them head to head. Our results show that the fastest two indexes are ART and the B plus tree, and they are sped up by 77% and 18.5% respectively. This table provides an overview of the five database systems we used to evaluate our TPCH workload, W5. Where applicable, we used large buffer pools. The page cache is cleared before each query, and we measured the average of five warm runs for each of the TPCH queries. In W5, we applied what we've learned to five different database systems running all 22 of the TPCH queries. The bars here represent query latency reduction, so higher is better. Overall, we see good reductions in query latencies across all systems and queries. I will now summarize our findings and conclude the presentation. The strategies explored in this research, when carefully applied, can significantly speed up query processing workloads with little to no source code modification. Based on our findings, we have summarized our approach as a decision flowchart. The flowchart provides recommendations based on various application and system criteria. We suggest continued experimentation and analysis on this topic as both the hardware and software are constantly evolving. In summary, we have tested four sets of strategies to improve query performance on NUMA systems. We have evaluated five different workloads running on three different machines. Based on our results, we conclude that the system defaults provide performance that is suboptimal. We have demonstrated that performance can be significantly improved by modifying the application's thread placement strategy, memory placement policy, memory allocator, and by tweaking the operating system configuration. We have visualized these steps as a decision flowchart which covers several scenarios. We hope that this flowchart will help practitioners obtain similar speedups in their applications. Thank you for your attention. Please let me know if you have any questions or feel free to contact me at the indicated email address. Great, thanks for a very nice talk, Puya. We have time for questions. If anyone has questions, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Uh, while we wait for questions, uh, I have a question for Puya. Mm -hmm. uh, Puya, in uh, your comparison of different databases, uh, I noticed that Postgres uh, does not seem to give much benefits uh, regardless of what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, is there some reason for this? Why Postgres is not affected? So, is it already tuned beautifully or it's so badly untuned that you can't get any benefit? Um, I would probably say it's more of the latter. Uh, Postgres uses a multi-process uh, model for its uh, uh, to provide concurrency and um, it passes uh, data between the processes using its own built-in system and that reduces the amount of impact uh, the amount of influence that we can have on it compared to let's say QuickStep or MoneyDB which uses multi-threading. Are there any other questions? I had one. Uh, yep. So, have you tried out some machine learning techniques uh, similar to auto tune, wherein some of these configurations or tuning was uh, you know, the machine learning could predict? Uh, so, we've considered uh, that machine learning could play a role. We've also considered maybe uh, developing an application that can run on a system and try out various uh, settings and try to find what works best for that machine. However, that's in our future work. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? 
I have one other question. Uh, mm-hmm. So a lot of these results were on standard uh, code, right? Uh, now, how much of this is, uh, okay, Postgres, let's rule Postgres out, but taking the other things that you looked at. Uh, how much impact is there because of uh, NUMA specific optimizations that are already present in the code? So in other words, if you took code that was not NUMA optimized versus code that is NUMA optimized, mm-hmm. uh, would that have an impact on the effectiveness of these techniques? Right, so if you've just written code as if you're writing it on a non-NUMA system, obviously you get a dramatic uh, impact on that. Uh, from all of the steps. If you've written code that has some degree of NUMA awareness, let's say you've written code that places memory on different nodes manually, you will still get a benefit from overriding the memory memory allocator, for example. You'll still get a benefit from overriding the operating system configuration. So while you might, you might see um, less of a gain, there is still a pretty significant potential. Thank you. Thank you. There's no other question. We can move on to the next talk. The next talk is by Li Jun Chang. It's on speeding up GED verification for graph similarity search. Li Jun, uh, are you here? Uh, Li Jun was not here earlier on. Or any other co author of that paper, if you're here, please identify yourself. Okay, even if the authors are not here. Uh, we can go ahead and play the talk. So uh, let's go ahead with that. Kushaka. Hello, everyone. Today I am going to present our paper on speeding up GED verification for graph similarity search. I am Li Jun Chang from the University of Sydney. Given a database of a set of as labeled graphs, the problem of graph similarity search is to find all the graphs in this database that are similar to a user given query graph. Here we use an inexact search. This is because in many applications, inexact graph search may find no result or very few results due to data noise or nature of, of the applications. Among several similarity measures, graph edit distance is a widely used one. So GED is a metric, it can be applied to all types of graphs, and it also captures the structural difference between graphs. Formally, the GED between Q and G equals the minimum number of edit operations that are needed to transform Q into G. So here, there are total six edit operations, including vertex relabeling, edge relabeling, edge insertion, edge deletion, isolated vertex insertion and isolated vertex deletion. So here for vertex insertion and the deletion, we are only allowed to insert or delete isolated vertices. So let's consider the computation of GED from the following example. So here, the GED between Q and G equals to five. We show a sequence of five edit operations that transform Q into G. So firstly, we change the label of V1 from A to B, and then we change the label of this edge between V2 and V3 to B. And then we add an isolated vertex V5 with the label C, and then we add an, an edge between V1 and V5 with label B, and finally we add an edge between V4 and V5 with label A. So you can verify that this resulting graph of modifying Q is isomorphic to this graph G. So basically, actually, VI is mapped to UI in this example. Then formally, the problem of graph similarity search is to compute the set of uh, data graphs in this database that are similar to Q. So here, similar is, is denoted by the GD between Q and G is at the most tau for a user-specified threshold tau. So a naive approach is to check whether the GED between Q and G is at most tau for every data graph in this database G. So this is expensive as deciding whether the GED between two graphs is at most tau is an NB complete problem. So as a result, the existing papers uh, adopt the filtering and verification paradigm. 
So which consists of two phases. In the first phase, it generates a smaller subset of candidates. And then in the second phase, it verifies every graph in this candidate set. So the uh, candidate generation will filter out unpromising data graphs by uh, possibly province and offline construct index. The general idea of this filtering is based on the pigeonhole principle. That is, if there are tau plus one disjoint substructures of Q not appearing in this diagram G, then the G between Q and G is uh, larger than tau. So in the literature, different substructures are used in this uh, filtering. So for example, path-based uh, filtering, tree-based filtering, and subgraph-based filtering. The existing studies focus on generating a small candidate set by designing different index structures. So all of them use an outdated algorithm, a star GD for the verification. In our paper, we propose an efficient algorithm called a star plus LSA to speed up GD verification. So our algorithm is orthogonal to the existing indexing and filtering techniques. Our experimental results show that the existing indexing and filtering techniques either have a very limited filtering power or take a very long filtering time. So for example, some of the filtering techniques may take even longer time than directly driven all the graphs by our verification algorithm. So as a result, the existing index and filtering techniques become obsolete given our efficient verification algorithm. The general idea of uh, computing the GED between Q and G is to enumerate all the vertex mappings from Q, and, from Q to G. And for each vertex mapping, we can compute an added cost, which modifies Q into G by obeying this mapping. So uh, as conceptually, we can view all these vertex mappings in a prefix shared tree. So this tree is called a search tree. So in this tree, every node re represents a partial mapping. So let's consider the partial mapping F14. So it maps V1 to U1, maps V2 to U2, and maps V3 to U3. For every partial mapping, we compute a lower bound. So for example, the lower bound of F14 is five. Then based on this lower bound, we can do pruning when we traverse this search tree. So recall that in this uh, GED computation, we allow vertex insertion and vertex deletion. So these are achieved by adding uh, dummy vertices to Q or adding dummy vertices to G. Um, so uh, our algorithm conducts a best first search of this search tree based on lower bounds of partial mappings. So our algorithm uses, uses a fixed matching order, which is computed uh, as a biofrequency of where matching on uh, algorithm. So the efficiency of A star plus LSA is achieved by three ingredients. So firstly, we do not need to add dummy vertices. Secondly, we propose a tighter lower bound estimation. Thirdly, we propose an efficient lower bound computation. I agree. So the first ingredient is we do not need to add dummy vertices. So we prove in our paper that if Q has a uh, few uh, vertices than G, then there is no vertex deletion in the optimal sequence of edit operations that transform Q into G. So here, optimal means the smallest number of edit operations. And then without loop of gen generality, we can assume that Q and C have the same number of vertices. This is because if Q has a uh, fewer number of vertices than G, then we can add dummy vertices to Q. And as a result, we do not need to consider vertex insertions and the deletions in this uh, GED computation of replication. So actually, in our implementation, we do not need to add dummy vertices to Q, even if Q had fewer vertices. The advantages of not considering vertex insertion and the deletion are as follows. Firstly, it reduces the number of four mappings. Secondly, it simplifies the algorithm implementation. The second ingredient of our replication algorithm is a tighter lower bound estimation. So let's consider the partial mapping F, which maps V1 to U1 and maps V2 to U2. Then given this partial mapping, we divide Q and G, both Q and G into two parts, the mapped part and the unmapped part. So the mapped part is denoted by Q sub F and G sub F. And similarly, the unmapped part is denoted by Q uh, sub F bar and G sub F bar. Then the label set based, uh, based lower bound uh, is equal to the, the following three terms. 
the number of added operations required to transform QF into GF by obeying this uh, partial mapping. And the vertex labor difference between the unmapped parts of Q and G and the edge labor difference between the unmapped parts of Q and G. So here, the number of edit operations required to transform QF into GF is one because we only need to change the label of V2 from A to D. So MCF equal to one. And then the label, uh, vertex label difference between our mapped part is the A, B, C, difference between A, B, C and A, A, E. So if this, what this part, and then the uh, edge label difference between our mapped part is difference between A, A, B, and A, A, A. So we have this part. So as a result, the label set based on lower bound is equal to four for this example. So in our paper, we we'll propose an anchor or where label set based lower bound. So which separates all the, uh, the edges of all the unmapped parts into uh, two parts. So one is the cross edges, cross edges, which is actually the cross adjacent edges of the mapped vertices, and then the inner edges of the unmapped parts. So here, MCF is still equal to one, this is equal to one. And the difference between the um, labels of the adjacent cross edges of V1 and that of U1 equals to one. And the difference of the adjacent cross edges of V2 and U2 is zero because they have the same labels. And then the uh, inner edges of, of unmapped part of Q can then only one vertex la uh, edge label, and it contains two edge labels for the unmapped part of G. So as a result, this part equal to one. And then finally, the difference between the vertex uh, label sets is equal to two. So we can see that the anchor of where label set based lower bound is equal to five here, which is larger than the label set based lower bound. So in our paper, we formally prove that uh, the anchor of where label set based lower bound is always no smaller than the label set based lower bound for every partial mapping F. The third ingredient of our replication algorithm is an efficient lower bound computation algorithm. So recall that in the best first search for a partial mapping, we need to compare the lower bound of, of all its children. So a children means extend the map, partial mapping by mapping one more vertex. The existing works compute the lower bound for every child independently. As a result, they have the total time complexity of uh, OVG times EQ plus EG. In our paper, we propose an efficient algorithm with the total time complexity of EQ plus EG. So this reduces the time complexity by a factor of VG. The general idea of our algorithm is we online construct a data structure and we conduct computation incrementally. That is, we do computation sharing when we compare the lower bound for different uh, children. So now let's see the experimental results. So we evaluate the algorithm on two uh, widely used chemical compound databases. So both databases contain uh, tens of thousands of uh, small graphs. So the largest graph in AIDS database contains over 200 vertices and over 200 edges. So AIDS contains um, 66 different number of vertex labels and three different uh, edge labels. And all the algorithms are run in main memory and run as single thread algorithms. So first let's look at the index-free graph similarity search. So we compare our uh, star plus LSA algorithm with CSIGED and INVEST. CSIGED is proposed in ICD 2016 and INVEST is proposed in EDBT last year. Uh, to verify uh, the, uh, the GD between two graphs, all the three algorithms first run label F for filtering. So label F is a label filtering. So that is, if the uh, label set based lower bound is larger than tau, then G is pruned. Is pruned. So the label filtering is, uh, can be conducted in linear time. So here is the result. Uh, the report processing time for uh, answering 100 random queries. So the x-axis is varying the threshold tau. So you can see that our algorithm uh, outperforms the existing algorithms across all the different settings. 
of tau n databases. Uh, specifically, when tau equal to seven, and on the pop chem data set, our algorithm is two orders of magnitude faster than existing algorithms. And now let's see the filtering effectiveness of one of the uh, state-of-the-art index-based filtering uh, uh, for graph similarity search. So here we only evaluate the filtering phase of uh, the path. We do not evaluate the uh, verification phase of the path. Uh, basically, we record two numbers. The first three is the filtering time ratio, which equals the filtering time of pass divided by the total running time of our uh, verification algorithm. And secondly, we record the filtering can candidate ratio, which is the number of candidates filtered by pass divided by the total number of candidates generated by uh, the naive uh, label F algorithm. So we can see that when tau uh, is small, it at most uh, three then it can, uh, parts can fit a lot of um, uh, uh, data graphs, but it also takes a very long running time, which is like for this one, it is 30% uh, of our uh, algorithm. And also for tau equal to one, parts, like the filtering time of parts actually is longer than our verification algorithm. So from these figures, we can see that even, even if we use parts to do a filtering, it will improve or uh, reduce the running time of our verification algorithm by at most half. So which means this, uh, the filtering effectiveness of pass is very limited. So here is conclusion. We propose an efficient algorithm to speed up GD verification, which is achieved by three ingredients. So given our efficient algorithm, the existing indexing and the filtering techniques become obsolete. To assist the future research, the source code of our algorithms will be available at the following URL. So currently, this URL contains the binary code of our algorithms. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think I Legion is here. Legion, if you are here, speak up. If not, we'll move on to the, uh, so if you have any questions about this talk, uh, please use the Slack channel and hopefully Vijan will monitor that, although he's not here with us uh, right now. So let's move on to the next talk. Uh, and this is by Damian Girowski. It's on scaling out schema-free stream joints. Uh, Damian is a PhD student at TU Kaysers Law Term. Kushagra, please play the talk, and Damian is here to answer questions after that. Hello, my name is Damian Gyroski, and welcome to my talk for the paper Scaling Out Schema-Free Stream Joints. Uh, in our work, we considered computing natural joints over schema-free JSON documents. On the left side, we have an example set of documents where all of the attributes do not appear in every document, and also the documents can have an ar arbitrary number of objects. We want our approach to provide all the documents that can be joined with one another based on the natural join definition. This means the two documents can be joined if for the equally named attributes, they have equal values. If they have at least one conflicting value for the same attribute, they won't be provided as a result. Uh, from the presented example, document D1 is joinable with documents D2 and D4 because for the same attributes, they have equal values. On the other hand, it cannot be joined with document D3 uh, because for the attribute user, they have a conflicting value. Uh, to go into more details, we consider natural joins over a stream of schema-free documents. As a result, we are operating over a potentially never-ending flow of data that cannot be stored. For that reason, we operate on the data as it arrives and the processing is distributed over a cluster of machines. To provide real-time answers, the computations are performed over the most recent documents or a subset of the data. Uh, traditionally, there are two types of window, sliding and tumbling windows. Uh, in our work, we consider tumbling windows, and in a tumbling window, the documents are grouped either based on time or count. The main difference with the sliding window is that the windows do not overlap, which means that the same elements cannot be part of more than one window. Uh, having our goal and setting in mind, we can try to tackle our problem. So again, as input, we have adjacent documents presented on the left, and for performing the join, we have three machines available. Uh, one approach can be to emit the documents based on single attribute value pairs. In our example, machine one will be responsible for all of the documents that have the attribute value pairs A2 and D7. 
By analyzing the distribution of the documents among the machines, it is noticeable that in the worst case scenario, every document can be embedded to every machine. This will cause an unnecessary replication of the documents. Moreover, machine one has much more assigned documents than the other machine, uh, which leads to unbalanced load and can result into one machine being a bottleneck and affecting the computation of the whole approach. Uh, having this in mind, we can see that to satisfy our goal, we require efficient grouping of the documents. To reach our objective, we need to perform two tasks. First, we need to partition the documents on the available machines, such that the number of partitions will be equal to the number of available machines, the potentially joinable documents will be located on the same machine, and the partitioning algorithm will strive for low replication and equally balanced load among the machines. Once the partitions are computed, we will identify all the joinable documents for every partition by executing the joining algorithm on every machine. Uh, we introduce a partitioning approach based on association groups, uh, and the proposed partitioning approach uses the attribute value pairs of the documents to create the required partitions. The algorithm is based on the observation that the occurrences of the elements within the documents are not arbitrary. The elements can depend on one another and regularly follow the same pattern of occurrence. Some elements can constantly appear together in groups, which we call equivalence groups. And additionally, some attribute value pairs can appear only when a specific attribute value pair appears and not alone. We call them implications. Our algorithm is performed in two phases. In the first phase, we compute the association groups based on the equivalence groups and the implications between them. And in the second uh, phase, we assign the computed association groups to the partitions. For the, now we want uh, to compute the association groups for the given input set of documents. So first, we need to form the equivalence groups uh, by grouping all of the attribute value pairs that constantly appear together. For example, for the equivalence group 3, whenever its attribute value pairs A7 and C4 appear, they appear together. Once the equivalence groups are computed, the implications are formed by identifying the equivalence groups that imply one another. We have identified that A2C7 implies B3. This can be seen from the documents because whenever A2C7 appears, then also B3 appears. But by looking at document D2, we can see that B3 can appear and so on. Uh, by grouping the equivalence groups that satisfy the implies relationship, the association groups are formed. And in our example, we have three association groups. Additionally, during the computation, we also need to compute the load for every association group, which represents the number of documents um, in which the attribute value pairs of the association group appear. So we have the load for all of the uh, association groups, where, for example, for the first association group, we have load 2, because its attribute value pairs appear in the documents D1 and D2. In phase 2, the computed association groups are assigned to the available partitions, where in our example we have two partitions available. Uh, the algorithm starts by selecting the association group that has the highest load, which is the first association group in our example, and it assigns it either to a free partition or to the partition that has the least load. Since at the beginning the initial partitions are empty, it will be assigned to the first available partition. The same procedure will be repeated for the second association group, and thus all of the partitions will be populated. So for the last association group, it needs to be assigned to the partition that has the least load. Since in our example both partitions have the same load, it will be assigned to the second partition. So this concludes our algorithm for creating partitions for the input set of documents. As next, I will introduce our natural join algorithm. So our join algorithm uses the frequent pattern tree as a foundation for finding joinable documents. The FP tree enables us to store the documents in a compact manner by merging the common prefixes of the documents. By building an FP tree, the number of accesses over the documents is reduced since there is one pass needed to create a fixed ordering of the documents and a second pass to populate the documents, to populate the tree with the documents. Uh, it allows for faster navigation since documents that share the same attribute value pairs will be located on the same branch, thus giving us the possibility to develop a better join algorithm. Uh, to build the FP3, first we need an ordering of the attribute value pairs of the documents. This is accomplished by imposing a fixed ordering of the attributes. The attributes are order, ordered based on the number of documents in which they appear in a decreasing order, and if two attributes appear in the same number of documents, then the attribute that has a lower number of distinct values will have a higher priority in the order. As a result, we have the ordering BAC, since the attribute B appears in most of the documents and the attribute C in the least number of documents. Following the fixed ordering, the attribute value pairs of the documents are ordered, and this is shown in the third column of the table. 
Next, we need to create the FP3. The FP3 is initially empty, consisting of only the root. And in every iteration, we'll select the next document and assign its key value pairs as nodes of the tree. Uh, first, we select document D1. And because the tree is empty, the attribute value pairs of the documents are added as a branch of the tree. In the last node of the branch, we store the ID of the document, which indicates the documents for the nodes of the branch. For the next document, we analyze the children of the root, and because there is no node as the first attribute value pair of the document, document D2 is again inserted as a separate, bra separate branch of the tree. For document D3, uh, since the root already has a child labeled B7, we do not create a new node, but we take this node as the next node in our iteration. For the next attribute value pair of the document, A3, again, there is an equally labeled uh, a node as child of B7. So, uh, again, no new node is created, but only the ID of the document is stored in the node A3. Uh, for the last document, uh, since the node B8 does not have a child labeled C2, we create a new node. And this creates our uh, FP3 for the uh, given documents. Uh, our join algorithm is based on the observation that if there is an attribute that is present in all the documents, we can immediately ignore large portions of the tree. If there is such an attribute, we can be certain that it will be in the first level of the tree because of the imposed ordering. This means that we can directly navigate to the equally labeled node. This can be further generalized for all of the attributes that appear in every document. In this example, we are searching for the joinable documents for document 1. There is one attribute that appears in all documents, the attribute D. So we select the first attribute value pair of the document D1, and we search for the equally labeled node in the first level of the FP3. As a consequence, uh, the branch starting with the node B8 is completely ignored. Once there are no more attributes that are present in every uh, document, the algorithm continues to navigate downwards through the branch, and in every iteration, it checks if the currently investigated node is in conflict with any of the attribute value pairs of the document. If there is a node in conflict, it is ignored together with all of its consecutive children. Uh, from our example, the node A3 is not in conflict, so the document D3 is a resulting joinable document. Uh, the same holds for the node C1, and because it is the last node of the branch, the algorithm stops. Uh, we have implemented our proposed algorithm in Apache Storm, and at the top we can see the components of our topology. For every component, there can be either one or multiple instances, and the arrows depict the different stream groupings that we use. The JSON reader spot represents the input in the topology and is responsible for parsing the JSON documents. The partition creator and the merger both perform the creation of the partitions. Additionally, the merger uh, has the job to find the most suitable partitions for the new documents with previously unseen attribute value pairs. The assigner connects every partition to a separate joiner and it sends every document to the associated joiner. It monitors the partition quality and it initiates the recomputation of the partitions if needed. It also sends documents with previously unseen attribute value pairs to the merger based on a pre-specified strategy. Finally, the joiner bot performs the FP3 join algorithm on the assigned documents. We deployed our approach on a cluster of eight machines. As datasets, we used the node bench JSON data generation and also real-world dataset. For testing the performance of our topology, we investigated several configuration parameters, uh, such as the number of partitions M, the window size W, and the repartitioning threshold theta. We per performed experiments by changing one configuration parameter while keeping the others fixed. Um, we have compared our partitioning approach to the disjoint sets and the set cover based partitioning approach, and the natural join algorithm to the hash based join and the nested loop join. Uh, for the partitioning algorithm, we have measured the replication for every window as the average number of times that the same document has been sent from the signers to the joiners. In the left column, we have the experiments when varying the number of partitions, and on the right, when varying the size of the window. Our approach handles the increase in the number of partitions acceptably well by creating partitions without many overlapping documents. Additionally, as the number of partitions increases, the comparison of the re replication with respect to the worst case scenario of sending every document to every partition improves. This indicates the scalability of our partitioning approach. However, this is not the case for the set covers based approach, which no matter the number of partitions, always approaches the worst possible application of sending every document to almost every machine. The disjoint sets algorithm achieves the best possible application by sending the same documents to the smallest number of machines. When increasing the, the window size as expected, the approaches achieve better application. 
Again, we have the same trend where the DGN sets approach has the best replication, closely fo followed by our partitioning approach. As next, we have measured the load balance and maximum processing load of the partitioning algorithms. We define the processing load of a single joiner as the percentage of the assigned number of documents out of the total number of documents emitted for a given window. The maximum processing load represents the highest processing load at one of the joiners. The load balance is measured through the Gini coefficient, and a Gini co the Gini coefficient represents how much the actual load distribution deviates from the perfectly equal load distribution. In the left column, we have the load balance. Both association groups and the set covers approach uh, have satisfactory load balance, which for the synthetic data set is not drastically affected by varying the number of partitions. Unlike the others, the disjoint sets approach provides inadequate distribution of the documents among the machines. And based on the results, it can be interpreted that the disjoint sets approach creates partitions that are extremely different in the number of um, documents that they have. But only looking at the load balance, we can conclude that both association groups and set covers approach are suitable for partitioning schema free documents. But when we look at the maximum processing load, we can see that this is not the case. No matter the number of partitions, the set covers approach constantly has at least one machine where almost the complete set of documents has been assigned. This result can be accomplished by not having a partitioning approach at all, but by only sending every document to every machine. On the other hand, for our approach, the maximum processing load decreases when increasing the number of partitions. This leads to the conclusion that the association group's approach is highly scalable, which is not a result of replicating more documents, but of an efficient computation of the partitions. As next, we have compared our join algorithm to the competitors. It is important to note that every machine performs the join for the documents that it got assigned. This means that the join algorithm is performed locally at every machine. For that reason, we measure the execution time of the algorithm when increasing the number of documents. Evidently, our proposed join algorithm is superior when performing joins over a large scheme of free JSON documents. The time needed for both creating the FP3 and performing the FP3 join approach when handling 10 times more documents is orders of magnitude better. For joining only 50,000 documents considered a small amount in a streaming environment, both the hash based joint and nested loop joint need minutes. This is even more evident for the more diverse synthetic documents where the hash based joint and the nested loop joint need around 20 and 50 minutes respectively. So I have presented our approach for computing natural joints over a stream of schema free JSON documents, which comprises two algorithms, the partitioning algorithm based on association groups and the FP3 joint algorithm, which uses the frequent pattern tree as a foundation. Through extensive experiments, we have shown the suitability of our overall approach. I would like to thank you for your attention, and for more details, please check out our paper. Thank you, Damien. We have time for questions. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask questions. Questions, anyone? I have a question uh, while we wait for others. Uh, so you're looking for uh, frequent patterns in the attribute with values or just the attributes? I was a little confused over there. Yeah, for the attribute values, so uh, for their combination. Uh, so what if a particular input stream does not have this property, that maybe the attribute uh, uh, patterns repeat with different values, but the values differ a lot, so there's no frequent uh, combinations, then what happens? So we do not consider exactly frequent combinations. So we only look at whether uh, the attribute value pairs appear together or if there's an implication between them. And exactly for that reason, we do not consider the frequency because if um, there, there are not enough frequent uh, items or even if there's a document that does not have any frequent set, it won't be emitted to any partition and basically it will contradict our, um, our, our goal of finding all of the docu documents that can be joined. So uh, you actually find every single pattern and assign it to it. So you're yeah. assuming that the patterns are fixed in the stream coming in. Uh, no, we try to define actually the pattern, so we do not assume whether. So but if uh, after some time the patterns change, then we'll recompute the partitions from the beginning. How do you know that the pattern has changed if a tuple does not match any of the existing patterns? Yeah, so if uh, we cannot find uh, attribute value pair that belongs to any of the partitions, 
it, it means that it will either be emitted for updating the partitions or if, if, if it does not satisfy the requirement for updating, it will be emitted to every partition. And over time, uh, it, this will directly affect the load balance and the replication. And this will initiate the re recreation of the partitions. Oh. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Uh, there is a question uh, from Nikos. Nikos, why don't you unmute yourself and ask it? Yeah, hi. Um, so do you consider only scalar JSON fields for your join condition? Have you tested, uh, like, have you, does your algorithm work on arrays or other inner objects? So prior to the uh, sending of the documents, we uh, decompose the arrays as separate objects and basically we consider them as separate fields then in the join results in the FP3. So every element of the array will again be represented as a separate node in the FP3. Any other questions? Okay, if there aren't, uh, let's uh, thank Damian for a nice talk. That brings us to the last talk of the session. Uh, by the way, in a normal session, we would uh, have a small round of applause, but virtually we are not able to do that. So uh, every one of you should be aware that uh, we all appreciate your talk. Okay, so the last talk is uh, by Britt Youngman. It's on uh, contribution maximization in probabilistic data log. And Britt is a PhD student at Tel Aviv University under the supervision of Tova Milo. Uh, Britt is here to answer questions. Uh, and uh, Kushagra, please go ahead and play the talk. Hi, my name is Britt Jungban from Tel Aviv University, and I'm going to present the contribution maximization in probabilistic data log a joint work with Professor Tova Milon and Dr. Yuval Moscovich, also from Tel Aviv University. I'm gonna start with the motivation. <clears throat> so the use of probabilistic data log has been recently advocated for applications that involve recursive computation and uncertainty. It allows for a flexible and expressive, and expressive knowledge of the revision. However, it makes the analysis of query result a challenging task. Query result analysis is useful for multiple tasks such as identifying the critical reasons for error or understanding the reason for surprising results. In this work, we're gonna present a framework for analyzing what set of input apple affected the most a set of output apple, uh, a set of, output apple of interest, namely the query result. To illustrate, consider Amy. Is in, uh, Amy is an information extracting system that mines logical rules from knowledge-based based on the correlation in the database. The mind rules are then treated as a data log problem, which may be evaluated with respect to the knowledge base to derive new facts or to address data incompleteness. Since the program rules are automatically mined, there is inherent, uh, there is inherent uncertainty with, res with respect to their validity. And therefore, Amy associated corresponding probability to the rules yielding a probabilistic data log problem. To illustrate, Consider the following database instance. Construct from, from three tables, the export tables, the import tables, and the deals with table, describing international trade relationships between, between countries. Also consider a small probabilistic data log program consists of three rules, where this program outputs the binary relations, including information on international transitive trade relations. The role probabilities in this, in this simple example, marked in green, <laughs> capture the fact, fact that transitive uh, relations are considered less trustworthy than direct deal, deals with relations. Running this program over this uh, database instance yield the following output. As can be seen, some of the, uh, some of the output, may, uh, the, out, the program output may contain some surprising and unexpected results. For example, we can see, uh, uh, for instance, that, that the United States deals with Iran or that Pakistan deals with in India. The question that we ask in this, in this paper is which input table have contributed the most to this inference? So in this simple example, 
over 73% of the input apple have took part in the derivation of only these three uh, output facts. Thus, this is of great importance to identify that small, a small set of input facts that have contributed the most to this influence. However, to, to answer this question, one must first uh, quantify the notion of contribution. And this is what we're going to do next. <clears throat> next, I'm going to present the problem formulation. So intuitively, the contribution maximization problem, referred to as the same problem, is defined as follows. Given a set of O of output apple of interest, the question is, that we ask is which bounded size subset of the input apple have contributed the most to the derivation of O. To quantify the contribution in probabilistic data log, one must consider the following. First, the recursive relationship between the input and output data and the uncertainty need to be considered. For instance, in the previous example, the rules probability model the fact that transitive trade relations are, uh, are less likely to happen than direct relation. So this uncertainty of the rules, the rules probability, need to be considered. Second, we know that selecting the top case tuple with the highest individual contribution is not the same as finding a case size set of of tuples with the highest contribution, as two input tuples may contribute to the exactly same derived fact. Therefore, one must consider the joint contribution of a set of input tuples to a set of output tuples. Last, we know that the rules probabilities are independent, as they are mined independently, and so the instantiation of each rule. Thus, the the, ind the independence of the choice to fire rule instantiation or not from other rule firing choices need to be considered. <clears throat> we know that it, it is common to describe the process of probabilistic data log evaluation through the notion of a derivation tree. A derivation tree of a tuple T specifies the rule instantiation and intermediate facts um, used in the gradual process of deriving T to simultaneously capture all the derivation T of a, of a probabilistic data log program, we merge them into a single weighted derivation graph as depicted in this slide. The nodes in this graph represent the input tuple, the output tuple, and the rule instantiation, and the edge weight record the rule probabilities. As can be seen in this example, we merge here the one derivation tree of the tuple of the fact that the United States deals with Iran and of the tuple that Pakistan deals with India. And these two derivation tree, sorry, have been merged into a single weighted derivation graph. We define the contribution maximization problem with respect to this graph. Intuitively, a tuple T contributes to the derivation of a tuple O if the weighted derivation graph contains some directed path from T to O. The probabilities along the path capture the potential involvement of T in this derivation. The higher the probabilities are, the higher is the contribution of T to O. An important observation is that a random subgraph generated from the WT graph represents a random execution of the probabilistic program. And therefore, we measure the contribution of a set of input apple T to a set of output apple O as the expected number of nodes in O reachable from nodes in T in a randomly generated subgraph, namely, in a random execution of the probabilistic data log program. Next, I'm going to present our algorithms for the CM problem. We first note that an analog problem of selecting influential case size set was studied in the context of social networks. In particular, the classic inference maximization problem, referred to as the IAM problem, is the problem of finding a case, a, a, a case size set of users in a social network so that their aggregate influence on other is maximized. We established a connection between the IAM problem and the CM problem. Specifically, we show that the CM problem can be formulated as a, vi as a variant of the IAM problem, and as the harness result of the IAM problem are naturally transport to our problem as well, and we show that the CM problem is NPR. We first devised a naive approach, namely a p-time algorithm with the optimal approximation guarantees for the CM problem. This algorithm operates as follows. We first construct the full WD graph. Then, given an existing IAM algorithm, we find a case size set of input tuple with the highest contribution to the target set of output tuple. However, while this naive approach 
achieves the optimal approximation guarantees for the CM problem, the size of the WD graph may be huge, um, as it depends on the number of rule instantiation, namely the number of nodes in the graph, which is, clonal, which is clonal in the database size. And thus, this naive approach is impractical. We therefore devise an optimized algorithm that avoids the materialization of the full WD graph while maintaining the same optimal optimization guarantees. This algorithm allows for a significant saving in both memory and running time. Specifically, our algorithm takes as an input an IM algorithm and employs two optimization. Our first optimization harnesses principle from the classical magic set transformation. Intuitively, the magic set transformation rewrites the program such that the rule can fire only when the derived output fact is relevant for the, for the fact of interest. In our setting, we, we rewrite the input program so that we can materialize on the fly only a small subgraph of the WD graph that is required for the competition. Second, we know that existing IM algorithms are using sampling over the underlying graph to estimate the influence. We can refine our algorithm by bundling the magic set graph construction with the sampling process employed by the IM algorithm to further reduce the size of the materialized subgraph. Summarizing, our optimized algorithm avoids the materialization of the full WD graph while maintaining the same optimal approximation factor. And as, and as we will see in our experimental result, it, 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 achieves, it achieves a significant saving in both memory consumption and running times. We have experimented with four data sets, which include both data log rules and underlying database. We examine the following baseline. First, the naive CM, the naive algorithm, which first construct the full WD graph and then run an existing IM algorithm over it. Second, the magic set algorithm, which only employed our magic set transformation optimization. And last, we're gonna present the magic SCM, our full optimized algorithm, which employs our two optimization, the magic set optimization, Here we aim at studying the algorithm performance as a function of the number of derived tuples. To this end, we have used varying input data size to generate increasing number of output tuples. Recall that the memory usage of, the, of all algorithm is affected by the size of the materials, materialized weighted derivation graph. In the naive CM algorithm, we construct the full WD graph, while in the magic CM and the magic SCM, we only construct the relevant parts of the WD graph. As can be seen in the left-hand side of, um, um, of this slide, uh, <clears throat> both the magic CM and the magic SCM um, uh, memory consumption was less than 1% than compared with the naive CM algorithm. Also observe that the naive CM algorithm was, uh, uh, was, infinite, was impractical for, uh, for more than 2.2 output tuples. Namely, this algorithm is impractical for real-life uh, probabilistic data log problem. On the right, we can see the running times of the, uh, of the algorithm. We can see that the magic SCM algorithm achieves a running time reduction of almost sixth order of magnitude compared with the naive CM. Last, I'm going to shortly present related work and uh, our conclusions. Previous work considered uh, um, the contribution in the context of non-recursive SQL query very often disregarding probabilistic inference. They have also uh, quantified the contribution of a single input tuple to a single output tuple, whereas in the current work, we consider the contribution of a set of input tuple to a set of output tuple. We know that the demonstration of our framework was recently published, and you can see here the details. Last, I'm gonna present our conclusion and direction for future research. So we have devised a weighted derivation graph, a graph that merges all the derivation tree of a given probabilistic data log program in a database instance, and formally define the contribution maximization problem with respect to this graph. We have established a connection between the CM problem and the well-studied inference maximization problem, showing that our problem is also NPR and that an existing IM algorithm can be leveraged to our setting as well. We have presented an optimized algorithm 
which employs a given IM algorithm and achieves a significant performance saving compared with an naive approach while maintaining the same optimal approximation guarantees as the naive approach. Direction for future research include the development of additional index-based optimization and the incorporation of user constraints imposed, imposed over the input tuples or the output tuple of interest. Thank you very much for listening. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Britt. That was a nice talk. Uh, we have time for some questions. Anyone who has questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. So uh, if you consider the non-probabilistic part of it, uh, there was some work long back on explainability of a particular answer. Um, how does this uh, work connect with some of that sort of work, which does not consider probability? Um, so, as we discussed in our paper, uh, previous work, um, as I mentioned, previous work considered the, the contribution in a, in a simple SQL queries uh, with no probability. So, our definition a difference for their uh, definition for uh, contribution. Um, <clears throat> as uh, I, I didn't mention it in the paper uh, because uh, in the talk because we didn't have at the time. But in our work, we consider the contribution of a set of input tuple to a set of output tuple, while this work we consider only uh, the contribution of a single input tuple to a single output tuple. So this is the main difference between this work and, and the previous work. And also, as uh, you mentioned, the, the, we also uh, take into account the, the rule probabilities and also the input and output tuple uh, probabilities as well, while previous work ignores such um, uh, this day mentions. And if you uh, go beyond uh, this sort of data log rules, uh, there is this whole probabilistic programming model. Do you think uh, your techniques could be applicable for the general probabilistic programming model? Yeah, thank you very much for this question. Uh, this is actually a very interesting direction for future work. Um, we haven't uh, actually uh, thought about that, but uh, this is sound very interesting and maybe we're going to look at the uh, other uh, probabilistic uh, a problem beside the probabilistic data log and I believe that our approach could be applicable to those uh, kind of problems as well. Thank you. And any other questions please? This session has a bunch of people who don't have too many questions or the talks have been very good and have left people speechless. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, maybe we can thank uh, Britt and all the other speakers virtually. Uh, and that brings us to the end of this session. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, we have uh, the next session in this room after half an hour from now. Uh, that's on, uh, let me just bring up that. Yeah, it's on search and information extraction and uh, it's chaired by Chen Kai Li. So if you're interested in that join or if you want to stick to the query processing theme, then we have uh, query and stream processing in room five, uh, and that's chaired by Devesh. Thank you, and uh, please enjoy the rest of the conference.